Is the customer experience you're providing starting to suffer with the rising cost of verifications? Instead of running VOEs and VOAs at application and getting day one certainty to keep from having to get income and asset documents from your borrower, companies are having to limit the amount of verifications being done because of the extra costs involved. Well, Truve.com is helping solve that problem. Mortgage lenders are saving 60 to 80% of those income and employment verification fees compared to other platforms like Equifax's The Work Number just by using Truve. That savings allows you to run more verifications or add and retain more full-time employees, which helps create a better customer experience. With off-the-shelf LOS and POS integrations that can be configured in a matter of hours, implementation is easy and there's minimal change management. With more competitive costs and a superior product to all other employment, income, insurance, and asset verification products, trying out Truve is a no-brainer. Check the link in our show notes or go to Truve.com. That's T-R-U-V.com today. We all want to learn how to create more opportunities for home ownership. Well, Freddie Mac's Equitably Speaking podcast does just that by teaching mortgage professionals like you how to expand their business by closing more loans for minority borrowers and underserved communities. I actually had the opportunity to be a guest on the inaugural episode, Breaking Into Underserved Markets, alongside Vice President of Single Family Equitable Housing at Freddie Mac, Pam Perry. The second episode of Equitably Speaking, Creating a Sustainable Book of Business and Underserved Markets, features Single Family Affordable Lending Manager at Freddie Mac, Monda Webb, and the author and financial coach, Dr. Lynn Richardson. They share knowledge on what it takes to create a sustainable book of business and underserved markets. Equitably Speaking podcasts will be releasing episodes every other week, so make sure to tune in wherever you listen to podcasts to learn how you can expand your business, close more loans, and help close the homeownership gap for borrowers in underserved communities. Welcome to the Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast, where expert guests teach you how to have success in the mortgage and real estate industry. Here's your host, Phil Treadwell. All right, welcome back to the Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Treadwell. Our mortgage marketing expert today is Tyler Hodgson. He's the Executive Vice President of Growth at U Mortgage and was the original founder and president of NXT Mortgage. Uh, proud of the mortgage industry, he served in the United States Marine Corps. From what I understand, once a Marine, always a Marine. Uh, so thank you very much for your service. Uh, he's also been in the finance realm, has a CPA license. And I tell you what, this guy is a young guy, a huge up-and-comer in this industry. And I'm really, really excited about this conversation because we've got to collaborate a little bit. He's a wealth of knowledge. So you guys are going to love this ep- episode. Tyler, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here and hopefully uh, share, share some good nuggets with the audience. I have no doubt. Well, man, I want to jump right into it because, you know, we, we've we kind of seen each other from afar for, for a while and, and recently started kind of collaborating on a few things here and there. But man, I just love to get your overall take on really what's happening in the industry, what people need to be excited about, because I think there's a lot of doom and gloom. You know, it has been tough. Like no, no one's denying that. It's probably one of the more difficult times we've had in the mortgage industry, but you put out a ton of good content and really understand, you know, what's going to help make people successful as, you know, your role as a leader and as a founder of a company and someone understands this stuff. So I just kind of like to get your take of what's happening right now. What should people be excited about? What are some opportunities they can capitalize on? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot to be excited about. I I think in every market, there's a lot to be excited about, but also like every market's always change. Every market's difficult and has its pain points. So, you know, it's easy to focus on the negative, but I try to always just shift my mindset to the positive and and what's the bright side and what's the positive that's upcoming. So I think right now everyone's feeling a a little bit more relief, depending on when they hear this podcast, you know, rates, rates recently dropping. I think we're coming off the highs, you know, the the Fed's talking about their potential rate cuts in 2024. And and so we've got, uh, you know, hopefully brighter times ahead than what we experienced through really tough year of 2023. But also I, I enjoyed 2023. I feel like it was it was the worst year, but in, in some ways it was also like my best year in the sense that, you know, I got back to the basics on a lot of things. I improved a lot of processes. I learned a lot of skills and, and things that, you know, now I'm going to be a lot better in the future because of them. So I'm excited for the shifts and the changes and the next challenges to come. I'm not a fortune teller. I'm not a soothsayer. I, I don't know exactly what the next market's going to be and what the next challenges are going to be, but I know we've got to stay on the forefront 
of marketing, technology, AI, like all, all the things. You always constantly have to be innovating, and that's innovating both like technology-wise, but also your, your personal and professional skills and sales and communication, everything. So, you know, my focus is like always innovating, always improving, and analyzing what the market's giving you so that you can adjust, you can adapt, and Marine Corps saying here, adapt, adapt and overcome, always adapting. So those are some things that I'm just always cognizant of and, and I'm excited for in this upcoming market. You know, you've had an incredible track record, specifically as a leader. Founding NXT Mortgage grew very, very quickly. Being the EVP of growth for you, Mortgage, as you guys had your merger. I'd love to know, as as you're coaching and teaching and training loan officers that are on your team that work for you, that just work around you, people within the industry, you've continue to maintain growth. You just said, hey, this is, yes, been one of the hardest years, but it's still been one of my best years. Mm -hmm. What are some of those things that you focus on or quote your secrets to always maintaining a growth model, even whenever things are challenging? It's just consistency and and things that you're doing and the, the hustle and the effort. And, you know, from a leadership perspective, it's a lot of leading by example. And you've got to hear where your people are at. You've got to be able to speak their language, understand them and actually listen. You know, I found if if times are tough, the leader is to like get more in the weeds, to really like hear the complaints and, and hear what they're saying and, and help them improve whatever the circumstances are and so that you can best support them. It's like when times are good, it's like you can almost kind of then kick back and relax, but not really either. <laughs> as I mentioned, like every market has its challenges. So like as a leader, you got to hone in on those challenges and dig deep into those to uh, be able to prov- provide the coaching, the training, and the leadership that your team members need. So, you know, it's in, in the previous market in, in 2023, as rates are increasing, things are getting difficult, affordability's tight, LOs are struggling to establish new realtor relationships or do transactions with their existing realtors. And so, you know, in that market, it was like, I was, you know, focused on like, if, if I was doing it, what would I be doing? How, here's, here's how I got a realtor. Here's how I went to an open, I went out to open houses. You know, our, our CEO, Anthony Casa, he went out to open houses and we're like back to the basics. Here's how we're doing it. And so I think when LO sees me going to an open house, they're like, oh wow, like Tyler's been a big producer. He's built a big team. He's done all these things. And like, he's walking in an open house, like meeting with a real estate agent and taking a picture and posting it on social media, doing some of those things where it's like boots on the ground. I'm in the weeds with you. I'm in the trenches. Let's, let's figure this out. And uh, I think that's a way to just kind of lead by example. Yeah, I, I love that you say that because we're, we're in a world where there's a ton of incredible technology. There's a ton of ways that you can get people's attention. We all know marketing's about getting people's attention. But I think a lot of times we focus so much on the shiny objects and the ways that it can make our life easier that we forget this business is hard and it's supposed to be hard. It's why we get paid what we get paid. It's why we have job security. If the phone just automatically rang and, you know, buyers came in in droves or borrowers came in in droves, they wouldn't need us. So the fact that it's hard should be a positive thing. But you're talking about understanding where are your potential partners' attention? Where is it that you can add value? Where is it you can create relationships? And that's out and about. Those are tactical things. Those are You know, as my old boss always said, nose to nose and toe to toe or or belly to belly or or whatever the the euphemism is, that's important, but it's so much easier to utilize technology to create those opportunities. So we do need to keep that in context. So I love, I I also, when I first got my, the, the mortgage business, I started my career handing out black and white photocopied flyers in real estate offices. And I would make sure on Thursday when they posted that list of where the open houses were on Saturday and Sunday. I was in every single one of them. Yeah. And and those are, those, are, those are huge opportunities. So I love that you gave that tip. But in terms of how you balance that, because you do create a lot of content, you do put a lot on social media. How do you use that and leverage that in terms of the other more old school tactics and success principles? Yeah, I mean, social media is obviously a, a scalable solution, a scalable platform. I look at, I mean, social media is like really my CRM. It's my best CRM. It's the way that I... You know, rather than send an email blast to a thousand people in my database, I post the same thing on social media, but make it a engaging content that people actually want to see. And I'm getting eyeballs on it. And I'm probably getting more views and more engagement than if I sent it in an email to, to a thousand people. 
So to me, I think social media is like the best CRM. And I, I add all of my past clients. I add all the real estate agents. I add every loan officer. I add industry professionals. Like I'm connecting and growing that sphere on social media and very intentional about, you know, posting a, a good mix of content about, you know, my personal life, my personal brand, who I am. People care about who you are for, for whatever reason. That's, you know, people connect with who you are. They want to know who Tyler is. They want to know who Phil is. And that's what interests them. And then, you know, obviously sprinkling in the content, the information about the industry and about business that they want to see. So I think this year, a lot of people have seen a lot more of me on social media because I've really got intentional about doing more content, more content, more posts. I'm posting multiple times a day. A year ago, a year and a half ago, I was probably posting once a day or every other day. And now I'm on like multiple platforms posting multiple times a day. And, you know, it's... It's a lift. It's hard work. Like you're you're creating content. You got to come up with ideas. You got to think of things. You have to really have your eyes open and looking for like, oh, is this a situation? Is this something I could post about? Like we're on this podcast right now. Now I'm thinking like, oh, I'm gonna need to take a picture and like post it. I'm on the podcast <laughs> with Phil and talk about a story. To let people, you know, here's yeah. why it was cool to be on this podcast. Here's what what's great about this, and and people will engage with that. Everyone that I know is pretty much on social media and, and the people in the industry know like there's value on social media, but at whatever level or scale you're doing it at today, you probably need to increase it. <laughs> like just like even I still probably need to increase it more, but uh, just, just more content and not just junk content just to get a number up, but you know, legitimately putting effort towards knowing that social media is going to be such an important part of your brand and your business for for many years to come. Man, you 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 gave so much great information there. I want people to go back and listen to that because you, you touched on a few things. But I can hear the conversations happening if someone's driving in their car and someone's sitting next to them. But Tyler, you just said I have to go to open houses and I've got to go meet with realtors face to face. And now you're saying I need to post a bunch of content on social media and I have a business to run and a family. I don't have time for that. How in the world do I balance all that? And I know that you're uh, an incredible time management guy and understanding how all of these things play together. So what tips can you provide the critics, if you will, or the people that, that I also get to say, I understand social media, like we need to do it, but, but how in the world do I have time for that? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give a, I'll give a shout out to, to Nash Paradise. Who's got me right now, like in the middle of logging my time, doing a daily time tracker for, we, we committed to do this for each other for two weeks. It's a beatdown. It's brutal, because even me, I, I feel like I'm very efficient with my time already. I feel like like my calendar's full. I'm from one thing to the next, and a very minimal downtime in between. I wake up in the morning, I like I go all day, and I feel energized throughout the day. But doing this time log has helped me identify like, okay, when am I doing the proactive things or things I had scheduled versus reactive things, and where can I continue to improve that time. So I think if people aren't really conscious of their time or aware of it, they're probably wasting a lot of it. And doing some of these small things, like creating more content on social media, is a matter of a, you know a few minutes here or there. Maybe it's five minutes, ten minutes to craft a good post and post it on the different platforms. So you know you've really got to just find some of that extra time. But a lot of the things you're already doing. So if you're already going to the open house, you're already having the meeting you're now doing your life is the content so whatever you're already doing in your life you don't have to do a lot extra to like create content necessarily let's say you have a phone call or conversation with a borrower and you're talking about you know why they don't need to pay off their car to get (laughs) approved for more instead they should do this like the strategy or whatever for them to qualify for more house post content about that or if you're at the open house, post a picture at the open house. I'm at this uh, you know, beautiful home. So whatever you're already doing in your daily life, creating content around that will make it easier and more scalable rather than you trying to like sit down and think, okay, I've got to plan out my content. I need 20 topics for this week. What am I going to post about? Just go about your normal week, but pause throughout your day and say, you know, is this something that I could post something about? Is, is, this, is there a story here or a picture here? you know, something that I can share with others that's going on in my life. And so being aware of that as you're going through your day-to-day life, I mean, it's kind of hard. I mean, it takes training, it takes practice, but once you get used to it, it becomes second nature. And then you're like, all right, I'm just going to post about everything. The other tip here is I'm the way that I post and the way that I engage and interact on social media, there, there's two pieces of social media. 
one is you posting content and that's kind of what we're talking about but the other one is engaging in other people's content as well you can't just be a poster and never interact with anyone else because you're not building relationships you're not connecting you're just like you're just spamming and marketing once you start engaging and commenting on other people's stuff you start to develop these relationships and connections and of course the algorithms are going to reward you for that as well because you're building affinity and so keep in mind that you have to engage but where people will get into the trap and the time trap you run out of time if you're on social media you're just scrolling 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 all day and i'm guilty of it too sometimes i'll wake up in the morning and i roll over to my phone check a couple messages and all of a sudden i'm on social media i'm scrolling and 10 minutes goes by 15 minutes goes by 20 minutes goes by i'm like holy crap why am i not out of bed yet i'm still on social media i gotta try to get off of social media so i found that if you're if you're using your phone you're more likely to just like get trapped scrolling especially because videos and you know TikToks and reels will get you and you just keep going so when I'm posting and when I'm trying to engage on social media intentionally, I try to do it from my desktop when I can. And from that desktop browser, I can go comment on a few posts. I can interact with a few different people. I can open up some different groups and open up. I have tabs saved on like certain people that I like to interact with. Maybe you've got a referral partner that you want to make sure you're, you're seeing their content, you're interacting. Maybe you've got a recruit or a prospect that you're trying to build more of a relationship with or interact with more. Save their profile as a bookmark and then you just open their profile and go engage with it rather than having to scroll for 10 minutes to see if they posted anything that day. So you can do some little shortcuts and stuff to make sure that you make the most use of your time on social media and you're not just scrolling through getting clickbait articles and ads and <laughs> realize you wasted 30 minutes of your day doing nothing. Man, I, there's so much gold in there. One of the first things that I loved even at the level that you're at and what you've accomplished, you still do those audits, you still time track. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that I, I spend a lot of time with. And if, if you want a tracker, if anybody's listening in the show notes of this podcast is always the phone number to join our text community, go join the text community and just send a text time tracker. And I'll send you a link to download one, uh, a link that you can, uh, go use a time tracker. And what you want to do is you just want from when you start to when you get done for, you know, 30 minute increments, track what you're doing and then go back and look. It's the old red light, yellow light, green light. Green light is income producing activities that only you can do. What's, what's moving the needle in your business? Yellow light is income producing activities that you don't necessarily have to be doing. Those can potentially be delegated or maybe they're longer term ROI activities. And then your red light are, this is wasted time in my business. I didn't need to be doing this. And if you'll do that for a few days or a week, or in Tyler's case, a couple of weeks, it's really mind boggling about how much time we lose that we're busy, but not necessarily productive. And then all of a sudden you can carve out time to do these different things that you're talking about. And I love some of the efficiencies that you've got. One of the things that I do is every day I wish people happy birthday on Facebook and LinkedIn. And if there's someone that I haven't connected with in a while or that I want to connect to with in the future, if I'm doing it on my phone, I just screenshot their profile. And now I put those in a folder and I have a whole folder of people that I can go back and re-engage to talk to, to send a message to. But I love your, your bookmark idea because you can create a folder in your bookmarks and you just have those profiles just ready to go straight to and engage with. So guys, we just have to remember that the social media, you, it needs to be done with intentionality where you're talking about, hey, what's your purpose of being on there right now? Is it to engage with people? Is it to post with people? Is it to expand your network? We have to create intentionality because these algorithms are the biggest companies in the world. Their purpose is to suck you in and lose 15, 20, 30 minutes and, and not know that that time went by. So we have to be very intentional about what we're doing. I, I want to shift gears a, a little bit and, and, and talk about just the leadership and, and team building skills that, that you've kind of acquired and that, that you coach and talk about. A lot's happening with the industry. A lot of companies are shifting their models. There's you know mergers happening and buyouts happening. And unfortunately, some companies are going out of business, but everyone's looking for good talent. And, and there's a lot of people that are making moves right now in, in the anticipation that 2024 is going to be the year that we all think and hope that it's going to be. When it comes to the first step of just recruiting and hiring really, really solid talent. What are the things that you look for in the people as you're identifying, Hey, these are people that I may potentially want to work with. that would be a good fit for our team. What are some things that you look at within the industry that 
you know, may help some people who are leaders or have teams or want to expand their team really start finding the type of people that are going to help them build their business. Yeah, when it comes to like finding or vetting talent, it's really difficult. Like, you know, and if we're just talking loan officers right now, like obviously recruiting, hiring, retention, there's there's other roles too, like your administrative, your support, your operations, you know, or a- any other industry you're in that's applicable to, but specifically like loan officers or salespeople, if you're recruiting them. I don't know if anybody's cracked the code yet on like what makes a good loan officer a good salesperson because it's like, you know, oh, this super outgoing person, like they're going to be a rock star and then they're a dud. And then you got like this weird kind of introvert person, someone like Tyler, (laughs) who used to be, you know, accounting and like all of a sudden they're a rock star. And this person, you know, this person used to be a teacher and they're great. And then uh, this other person used to be a teacher isn't great. And, you know, do a disc profile and all, all these personality tests and I still haven't cracked the code. I, I think what you know I try to find is people who have like just this this desire they want it so bad and like they're willing to do the work. And so a lot of my interview process, a lot of my vetting process is I'm not trying to pursue them too hard. I want them to be pursuing me. I want them to show me that they want it. I want them to show me they follow up. So I might have a meeting with them or have a lunch with them and tell them like, all right, great, you know, I'll send you this follow-up and, and we'll go from there. I'll maybe send them a follow-up email and then I'll wait two weeks and see if they reach back out to me. Like, are they excited about it? Do they really want to be in it? Versus me trying to like just sell, sell, sell and like, all right, cool. Let's, you know, can we get you in next week and let's set a follow-up. So I want to see that they really want it and they want to be a part of it. With that, I, I'm trying to find people who the, obviously the personality and, and the culture fit long-term retention is important to me even if they're not a, a top producer or, or a rock star and you know number one it's like they could be middle of the pack they could be lower half and maybe i can help them get to the next level uh, if they are the right person the right culture and the right mindset i could help them improve and increase their production and then they're going to be even more loyal and even more thankful and, and bought in our culture so when i'm talking to someone meeting with someone i'm really trying to see like do they have a strong ego? You know, are they are they focused on themselves and, and all their questions relate to, you know, them and, and make them more comp and what are rates and what are pricing? I mean, it's the same things that like if a borrower calls you and they ask you, hey, what's your pricing? What's your rates? What's your fees? You're instantly kind of turned off by it. And sometimes I have conversations with loan officers and that's all they're asking. So what's y'all's comp plan? And, and all right, what are your rates? hey, well, you might not be a good fit. Um, I'm, I'm looking for the people who who want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And usually it's the people who are saying, you know, how can they contribute to being part of the team and how can they be a part of something bigger than themselves? And, you know, those are the people I want to invest in. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself and, you know, you know you've got to do your own personal production. It's not that they all want to be managers and leaders and, and build teams it's just that like even being a producing lo they want to be a group of in a group of other awesome producing los and and a lot of times from their conversations you can and the questions that they ask you can kind of get a feel for what is their purpose what's their why do their you know morals and ethics align with that of your culture i think that's so true the for, for me it's always been almost exactly what you said a lot of the low hanging fruit qualities that we think we want in loan officers or team members oftentimes may not necessarily be the right fit. I always want to try to find people that have the qualities that I can't teach. Do they have the desire? Like you're talking about that burn that I want to be a part of something. I want to grow. I'm willing to do the work. Those are the type of people that I think no matter what they did, whether it was in the mortgage business or selling cars or being an accountant, they would succeed because they have a desire to do that. And so I agree with you in a sense of, do they want it badly? Are they interested? I used to, to tell a lot of people whenever I was, you know, a regional national director, whatever, recruiting, listen, if, if I have to talk someone into coming to work for us, later I have to talk them out of leaving. I want this to be a mutual partnership. I want people to want to work here, to work with me, to work for me as, as much as I might want them to come on board. And if that's not equally kind of agreed on, if you will, 
then they're, they're, you're setting yourselves up for failures. Now, once you've got somebody on board, they're excited about being there, they're willing to do the work. What are some of the things that you kind of coach and teach on as far as really solidifying and building a team and scaling a team? You know, everybody wants to go hire an assistant or they want a marketing person, but I think you've got some insights on really what it takes to not only grow your business, but scale a team and, and become kind of duplicatable. And I'd love you to just kind of share some, some things that people need to be mindful of as they want to build a team. Yeah, I think a lot of people get this false idea that, you know, well, the, here's the things that I'm good at. Here's my green lights. And like, here's the things maybe I'm not as good at that I need to outsource or delegate. And so they try to hire someone to replace those things, which is the right thing to do. But unfortunately, a lot of times they hire someone who either that person doesn't know the processes or the systems to do it and you haven't built that for them. So it's like you kind of have to learn how to do the things you don't want to do or you're not good at doing and build the process around it and build the training around it so you can actually pass that off to someone successfully. Yeah. A lot of people just hire an assistant and and hope that like they're going to just be good at all those things without you being able to train them. And unfortunately, a lot of successful salespeople aren't, you know, professional trainers and you're not, you know, systems and process designers. So, uh, you know, if you're trying to build a team and, and scale a team and hire or you're going to have to put some time in like knowing here's the processes, here's how I'm going to train this person who's going to do this role and, and be very clear about that. But also I think some people try to give too much. They kind of blur job job titles. And I've seen that with loan officers a lot where they make that first hire and they're like, all right, they're my, they're my sales assistant. They're my business development person. They're my marketing and my social media person. They're my front end LOA. They're, they're doing credit pulls and pre-approvals. They're also doing pipeline management and they're doing my CRM updates and my past client outreach database and they're managing the office. So you know, they're, they're stocking the fridge and, and the toilet paper. And it's like, you just have like eight job duties, eight, job, eight role descriptions for that one person. Like they're just not going to be successful at it. And it's hard. It's not like you can go hire eight people at once. <laughs> and maybe that person could do like two or three of those effectively, but they're not going to find the jack of all trades who's just going to like do everything really successfully unless you happen to find the unicorn. If you find the unicorn, great, but like your chances of finding the unicorn are, are very slim. Knowing the role you're hiring for, making sure you've got processes and training in place for when you're ready to hire that person, that will help you be setting the right expectations with that position and have success actually outsourcing and delegating those things uh, that you don't like to do or you're not good at doing or you shouldn't be the best use of your time. Yeah, I think you, you nailed it in, in terms of systems and processes. If you're not hiring people that are going to plug into the systems and processes you have to scale your business, you're just hiring a warm body and they do become a jack of all trades where you're like, well, do this task, do that task. And and sometimes you do need a, a what I call a utility player. You, you do need somebody that can do a lot of different things. But most of the time, scaling a team is about hiring intentionally for a specific part of the process or, or hiring for a specific system to keep those in line. We uh, did a podcast recording here several episodes ago with uh, Sean Benozian, who we all know is you know, the top producer in the country, or has been historically for years. And that was one of the things we talked about is what does it take to scale to a hundred million dollars to a billion dollars to, you know, all these different things. And that was really his answer is it's all about systems and processes. And it really reaffirmed things that, you know, you're talking about right here. They need to be learnable. They need to be teachable. They need to be duplicatable. You've got to make sure that people buy into what that system is. Cause if you have a bunch of, of generals, and you don't have any any soldiers following, all of a sudden you're, you're going in a lot of different directions and, and that doesn't make for a, a very cohesive team and, and definitely not a productive one. So no, I, I definitely appreciate that. I know with some of like my hires, you know, with some of my hires early on, I kind of, you know, I didn't really have the systems or the processes fully defined or, or maybe I thought I did, but I didn't really. And, you know, I hired someone hoping that like they were going to fix that problem or solve that problem and they were going to build the system and the design, the process. And in general, that didn't really work out. Like I have to, I had actually designed and build the system and the process for them. And, and then they, they could work it, they could improve it. And then maybe they could see pieces I couldn't see, but because I've had got the bigger picture goal and I already have my other systems and processes, I kind of have to give them the playbook. I can't expect them to just create something that's all of a sudden going to align with what I'm already doing over here. So, you know, don't hire the person thinking that like 
they're going to come in and just have the solution and fix it for you. Uh, you've you've got to be an active participant in that as well. Man, I, I totally agree. I want to shift gears just a little bit. It's kind of a two part question. The, the first is, what do you think are the biggest blind spots that that loan officers or really any mortgage professionals have right now? of things that they're not thinking about that they really need to be aware of. And, and that could be positive or negative, but just blind spots in general. And then the second part of the question is, what are some opportunities that loan officers need to be thinking about uh, in terms of where the industry is going, what the state of it is right now, and, and really where they can capitalize and grow? Uh, you know, I think a blind spot is is definitely like past client database. I think that's always been a blind spot for loan officers. And we don't give enough attention and enough love to that past client database a lot of times we do the you know set it and forget it drip campaigns and know they're going to get you know a thousand emails out to my database and to me that's not an effective way a lot of us make a promise to our clients and and preach a client for life strategy i do your mortgage your client for life i'm gonna do your refinance your kids mortgage and all this stuff and then after closing they're gone to the wind and you're, you don't interact with them anymore. You don't engage with them. You don't provide any extra value. So to me, getting that client for life mentality, that past client database is probably a huge blind spot because those people are going to buy again. They're definitely going to refinance again now that rates are higher. And I think LOs are a little more aware of it now because they know, like, I got some loans with some high interest rates. I know they're going to refi. But I, I think that even the loan officers who've been closing loans in 2023, I think they've they're doing a bad job. They're telling the client before closing, like, yeah, we're going to refinance you in six months, 12 months, 24 months when rates drop, I'll, I'll reach out to you. But that's their whole like database strategy is I'll reach out to you when rates drop. And instead we need to be a little more proactive on that approach, staying in front of them. And that could be, you know, through social media, that could be setting reminders and tasks for yourself for certain checkpoints, you know, 30 days after closing, six months after closing, 12 months after closing, doing little things like like just sending a, a, a small gift or a thoughtful card, see something like, like they got married or, or they got divorced or their you know, dog passed away or whatever it is. They have a child, you know, happy moments, recognizing those things. And so the database has so much opportunity, so much value in it. We're so busy trying to get the next loan and, and hustling for the next realtor and finding a new client. We often forget the value of our existing database and those relationships we already have and the things that we've already worked for. Uh, there's so much value in that database and big companies recognize that and big data understands that, but loan officers usually, usually that's a blind spot. Man, that's so good. A database is a huge one. And we, we've talked about it a few times on, on the podcast, but a lot of us have a past customer database, but your database needs to include your partners and your sphere of influence. The, the same way you're talking about with social media, it can be the best database that you have. It doesn't have to be a CRM. And you know, we all get the question, what's the best CRM? It's, it's the one that you use. And if you're going to be on social media anyway, you might as well use that. But we do need to make sure and continue to follow up if for no other reason than when someone in their sphere of influence is buying a home or needs to talk to an advisor, you're top of mind and they remember that they worked with you. I think Black Knight put out a, some statistics and I, I can't remember if it was in 2022 or if it was earlier, but like, uh, I think it was from the 2021 kind of refi boom, if you will. And they put it out early 2022 that said only 15% of people that refinanced their house or did a subsequent mortgage went back to the original loan officer that they used the first time it was like it was less than 15%. It was a staggeringly small amount. And I know with real estate, it's it's around that if, if not a little bit a little bit worse. And so that does, you know, tell that we've not done a great job of that, especially whenever we're talking about being an advisor or a partner for life. And guys, we, we can't forget those people have already used us already taken advantage of our service and our product offering. We've already gone through the no like and trust model with them that curve is a lot shorter than trying to find someone brand new, but we're all always very eager. So I think that not only that a blind spot, that's a huge opportunity. So when you say that 15% number, I'm sure a lot of the listeners, myself included, were like, yeah, like I'm sure mine's a little bit higher than that. Like, I think we all recognize like, you know, but honestly, if you're thinking that it's probably your ego <laughs> and you're probably, you're, you're probably worse. So like, that's the data and it should be eye opening, and, you know, we can all improve that 
No, I couldn't agree more. Well, I want to be a good steward of your time. I know you have a ton going on. And I appreciate that you've taken some time uh, to do this. I want to ask you one last question, and, and we ask this of all of our guests, and that's if you could just give one tip to mortgage professionals today to go out to use to build their business, what would it be? This is a strategy that one of my loan officers has been using, and I think it kind of applies to some of the themes we've been talking about besides social media but when it comes to database and uh, real estate agent relationships too. And so we all know that as loan officers, we don't have the opportunity to provide a lot of referrals to our real estate agents. Typically, most of the business comes to us. When you get that buyer who has no agent, you're like, I get to refer this to an agent, it feels great. So this loan officer on my team, she has a strategy where she's very intentional about following up with her past client database. She, has, she schedules six month reviews every six months religiously. And just like going to the dentist, as soon as one's ending, she's already scheduling the follow up. So she's not waiting six months to reach out. As she's getting off the call with her, it's like, hey, Phil, all right, I'll see you again in six months. I'll be back on the podcast, right? <laughs> Let's schedule it right now and put it on the calendar. And she's doing that. But during these, these uh, reviews and these checkups, one of her questions to the buyers is at closing, she, she asks them, can you refer three buyers to Phil, your real estate agent, in the next six months? Can you, you know, if you come across anyone, the goal is three buyers. Can you refer six, three people to Phil in the next six months? Because Phil was an awesome agent. He was great. And usually the buyer's like, oh, yeah, of course. You know, I, I love it. I'm so happy they just bought the house. At the six-month checkup, she asked again, were, you know, were you able to refer those three people to Phil? Oh, no, you know, I didn't. Or, yeah, I referred my cousin. Be like, okay, well, you know. Can you, can you commit to referring someone? You know, Phil did a great job. You're right. Have you talked to Phil in a while? Can you refer someone to Phil? And so she's trying to get the buyer to refer to the agent, knowing that obviously that referral is going to come back to her. So it's a lot easier to ask for a referral for someone else instead of yourself. And I thought that's a really cool way to approach it because also she's telling her agent and reminding her agent when she's having these conversations that, hey, I'm asking for referrals for you. And then especially if the buyer tells her, yeah, I just referred – John over to Phil actually, and then the LO can reach out to Phil and say, "Hey, Mr. Agent, did Susie refer John to you? Yes, they did." So, anyways, I, I think that's a really good way of doing it. You're staying in front of your database, but you're also trying to generate referrals for your realtors. When your realtors know you're doing this, they're going to sit there and think, "Oh, wow, I'm not even that good at doing this either. I'm not. Realtors are not good at their database either." And so, if you can be good at the database for the realtor, uh, they're going to see a lot of value in that too. Man, that's a great tip. It, there, there's so many ways you can go with it. The realtors are appreciative of the effort, if nothing else. So it's going to create some loyalty and, and solidify that relationship. And the other thing that, that you mentioned in there is if you're out there actively working your database and talking to people, you can now confidently reach out to new agents that you don't have a relationship with and say ethically, honestly, I work a lot with past clients and people that they refer. And there's people that come up that don't have an agent. And so I'd love to have a conversation with you and see if our goals align. I may be able to give you some at bats and increase what you're already doing. And regardless of whether they work with a lender or not, that's an end to have a conversation. Hey, I, I'm sure you probably work with the lender. An agent of your caliber probably does. But I'd like to talk about a strategy to do business above and beyond that. And what happens is if their existing lender is not giving them at-bats, all of a sudden you're not just getting that business above and beyond. You're getting the whole thing. So this is an incredible tip. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, Tyler, if you would, throw out some social media handles, websites, anything you'd like to share. We'll get in the show notes so that people can connect with you, learn more about what you're doing. Yeah, so Instagram and TikTok, uh, Chief Loan Officer, super easy. And then on, on Facebook and LinkedIn, just search my name, Tyler Hodgson, and would love to connect with you. So if you uh, follow me and message me, I will follow you and message you back. Love it. Tyler, you've been an incredible guest. I do think this is one of many. When we get off here, we'll, we'll schedule a six-month checkup uh, podcast episode here in just a minute. I'll work with that database, Phil. I'm part of your database, that's, man. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, man, I appreciate it. I look forward to catching up again soon. All right. Thanks, Phil. Have a good one. Thank you for joining us. This is the Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast.